Good morning. Good morning. We are working on day seven. I'm sorry. We're on day 10. And working on breaking the spirit of poverty. One second while I cross share here. This here. Am I stuck? Hope not. Okay. So let's go. Today is day 10. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to see the comments today. We are working on <clears throat> lesson 10, breaking off the spirit of poverty. And I'm excited. We're almost there. <laughs> we are halfway there when we hit day 15 we are definitely hit the halfway mark so we have made it so i am excited to be able to do another round of this because i feel like when i help others it helps me god will stream out revelations in moments that um it's not just for you but it's for me as well so Always keep that in mind when people are teaching and delivering um, revelatory information. So let's start off in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this hour. We thank you, Lord, that you have ordained these days for your glory, that you have ordained it for your revelation to glorify your son. And so, Lord, we just thank you that we have the privilege and the honor to be able to come into your presence boldly before your throne and just draw from that well, from that living well of your heavenly kingdom. And Father, we honor you, we glorify you, magnify you in Jesus' name. So here we are. Let's start. There is another symptom to the spirit of poverty that reviles a lack of generosity for the number one sign. It's worry about your finances. So let's take a look at yesterday really quick. <clears throat> I separate my days as we go along. Um, um, let's see where it's at. Should be in here. Here it is. Yesterday, when we did lesson nine, we worked on the the symptom of lack of generosity. So today, I'll keep this out. Today, we're working on the rivals. A lack of generosity for the number one sign will be worry. Okay. So what is it saying? What is this saying? Well, let's make it clear as day. The word rivals. I'm not sure why it went there. I should put here a definition, right? Meaning, of course you heard me. A person or a thing competing with another. It's a person or a thing that competes with its... Com it's not competing. Yeah, competing with another. It's a competitor. It's an opponent. So, <clears throat> let's write this down. If I can. Okay. So... the opponent to I'll put this here so that you we are 
listening and taking information notes. Why doesn't this ever work right? Can I put it in here? It's probably easier for me to put it in here. Okay. The opponent to your lack of generosity is your worry. Your worry on your finances. I'm putting it in here so that you can see it. Okay. It's about the worry of your finances. Okay. John Piper, who is actually an author of books, but he also talks and teaches about scriptures. He says in his book, Future Grace on page 324, it says money is simply a symbol that stands for human resources. Money stands for what you can get from man instead of God. So those who receive the wealth or provision from God are free, whereas those who receive their money from man are slaves. If you've been watching, then you've been learning that our that money can be too, it could be good or it could be bad. It's dependent on words rooted. If your money is rooted in uh, anything opposite of God, then guess what? It's going to operate opposite of who God is. And so therefore is going to do one thing and that's enslave you to it. So what happens is worry comes in and says, you might not have enough to pay for your rent. You might not have enough to pay for your bills. You might not have enough to pay for your car. And when that thoughts, when those thoughts start coming into your mind, it locks in, right? It locks in to what we talked about yesterday, lack. When it lacks, when it locks in and operates with lack, then guess what? You do not become a giver or someone who blesses because you already have worry about your own life that you cannot have a mentality to be a blessing and someone else's worry. What it, so if worry comes in, if worry starts to take over, then it takes over. So what happens is it will produce that very lack. So we have to be, good morning, Joyce. We have to be conscious that worry is connected to the lack of generosity. Worry says, I don't have enough to eat, so I cannot give you five, ten dollars. Um, like the other day, and this has happened more than once. Like I, I I'm I come out the store and here in uh, in the land of Disney, where everybody thinks it's a magical kingdom, I gotta tell you, Florida has a high number of homeless people. And you can't blame them. Why would they not want to come and be homeless where it's not cold? You want to be homeless where it's hot and where there's fruit that you can eat off from the trees. But we have a number, a high number, a high number of homeless people. So sometimes I come out the door, out the store and I got double. <laughs> I have a double something. Okay. Not all the time. But like I had brought an ice cream and I brought one for my son who was with me and I come out and he doesn't want it. And so I'm thinking, okay, he's not going to want this now and now I have to eat it. And he's going to make me eat both ice creams like somebody who's a fat hog. So I started sitting there and I saw without at that moment, I saw the guy that was sitting there. I didn't think to give it to him 
because I'm still talking to him about why he's not eating it, why he's not going to eat it. I get in the car. I start to drive away and I hear my, my thought. You could have gave it to that man. And I thought, oh my God, like I already had drove away. I'm already trying to pound in the first one to then eat the second one because it's going to melt. But it was, it was that moment of not thinking of saying, instead of me eating both, I could have just gave him one. That's the spirit of generosity. That's when you can, you have, so you have something that you can give as it, simple as that. So there is something that you can give, but because you're so worried, you don't have the, you, you don't have that mindset to say, I'm more than blessed. I have a roof over my head. I get to lay down every day on my bed. We know what it is to, to not lay on our own bed for a season. We knew what it was to wish we were sitting on our couches for a season. We went through that. So we know now how to appreciate what we didn't have. And so when I think about that, I think about that even now, like we have a blessed, we're blessed to lay in our beds. We're blessed to have a comforter because we're cold at night. I mean, we we're blessed. They're not. And so why can't I give? God always makes a way on our on provision, always pays our bills. God pays our bills. Because if it wasn't for God to keep that company open, that signs that check every Friday, you wouldn't have your bills paid. So just saying, if you come to read the word of the Bible, you'll start to understand that there's this unmerited grace that non-believers have. You know, that's the grace that God gives a chance for people who don't believe to actually come and believe. Because I can't possibly think that they're doing this all on their own. So, worry is a result of looking to man for your material provision. Worry is a result to looking to man for your provisional, for your material provision. Okay? You ever ask somebody for something and then they'll tell you, oh, I ain't got it. You ever ask somebody to give you bread and they'll say, oh, I ain't got it. And so you can ask man all you want, but you're asking the wrong person. Let me tell you a testimony about someone that we met in North Carolina. We were in North Carolina and God takes me on these places, adventures, I say, or journeys to meet people. And I don't know them. And so we end up driving to this church where I felt like we needed to show up. And so we show up to this place and this man had just came down from, um, I don't know if it was Nigeria or whatnot, but he was a pastor of this place, of this, this half of house and then the front half of the house was the church. And so he lived there and he made us coffee and instead of sugar, he used honey. And it was the first time we've ever had coffee with honey. It was, it was, it's good, but I think we put too much honey because we didn't understand the concept. We've never had coffee and honey. And so, you know, some of us were a little sick to our stomach, but <laughs> it's good. And so that was the first time we were introduced to that. And then this man, this pastor says, he starts sitting down and telling us stories about faith. One day, and, and I love hearing this story, and it stood with me. He said one day he had nothing to eat, and he sat on his couch, and he said, God, I have nothing to eat. I don't have anywhere I can go but to you to ask for food. So he sits on his couch, and he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm going to stay here until you provide. And he sat on his couch and he watched the clock. And within an hour or so, someone came knocking on his door with bags of food. And I loved to hear his faith because it's faith that moves God. And so he sat there and he believed for God to show up and deliver his food. And, and he touched somebody's heart right in the middle of the supermarket to buy pastor food. And, and that's one of many stories that he had told us that day. But I remember this one as well. 
there was a single man. Um, I believe that the mom had passed away and he now had his children. And one day they decided that they would pursue God and they would just believe God for everything. They believe God for their gas. They believe God for everything. And they got in the car. And so um, they were running out of gas. And he said, kids, start speaking in tongues. And believe it or not, these children, whether they had it or not, began to speak in tongues. This was something that he taught them. And they began speaking in tongues and they spoke in tongues until it made it to the gas station. When they got to the gas station, there was someone there and they were waiting for him to put gas. They didn't even know this person. He gets to the gas station and the man says, God told me to wait and I, it was for you to put gas. They didn't know because he knew that he showed up and God prompted him and told him it's them. And so he filled up their gas tank. So they go off back on the road pursuing God. They needed a place to stay. So they finally found a place. This woman had a kind of like a cabin and she kind of just said, we'll let you stay there. And because he explained the situation that they didn't have any money. And she said, it's fine because I, I, they were, she was a Christian. So she let him stay. Well, they're in this house. Remember, I just said there wasn't any money. And they're in this house and the kids were like, he, that morning they woke up and the kids were like, dad, we're hungry. And he says, well, let's pray to God. And they begin to pray to God and they begin to speak in tongues. And they did that for almost an hour. He looked in the cabinets and nothing was there. They went back and they prayed again. And he says, now we're gonna ask God specifically what we want. And they said, I want cereal and whatever cereal was. And the other one said, I want. And so the father said, I want. Long and behold, 30 minutes of that prayer 35 minutes of that prayer, should I say, almost like an hour, let's say, someone knocks on the door and says, I was at the supermarket and God told me to start buying these things. And I didn't know where to take it to and he led me here. And so they're, they knew that that prayer that they've done was God. And when they opened the bags, exactly what they asked for the exact cereal brand was in the bag. So our riches, our wealth, our inheritance are not found here on earth because it's on earth and that's what we need to be doing. Our riches and our wealth are found in Christ. And so the problem here on earth is not the fact that we're lacking because we don't have money. It's because you're lacking because you have no faith. You are in full doubt. You live your life in unbelief and doubt. And to fulfill that void, you look for a job that pays you well enough so that you can believe in your check to be able to live your life until a pandemic hits and you have no job. If you were lucky this season to even keep your job, then you should give God all the glory because that's his handwork. So when we're talking about worry, we're talking about worry is the result of man chasing man for provision. So see, my examples of the stories that I just gave was not examples of worry, but it was examples of faith because it's not worry that will supply all your needs. It's faith that supplies all your needs. Let's look at Matthew chapter six, verse 19. Matthew chapter six, verse 19. 
I want to say this, and I don't know why I feel like I have to say it, but you know, when God, when God has people pray for people, he's asking you to pray in faith. He's not asking you to pray because you see the situation and you're worried. He's asking you to come into prayer and have faith. We come into prayer, maybe most of, the, most of us, with the thought of, oh my, my goodness, the situation is out of control. God, you must take your hand and you have to do something because you're God and you're the one that can do it. But that's not what God is saying. That's not what God is saying. God is saying, I didn't ask you to come into prayer and pray like a madman who wants me to do something. I asked you to come into prayer in faith, in faith. And so we have to think about mothers who pray for their children who are addicted. They're not asking God to, uh, God, you see, you know, where he's at, blah, blah, blah. No, God, I'm asking you by the power of your word, by the power of who you are to break off the yoke of addiction. So it's not, it's not an SOS. Okay. It's an SON. What am I saying? I'm not call. I'm not praying from a place of a beggar. I'm praying from a place as a child of God. It's a difference. I'm not sending you an SOS out of my carnal emotion. I'm sending you an SOS out of the, the reality of who you are, God, of who I believe you are and what you can do. You make things that are impossible for us possible. So I just felt like I had to lay that out because Maybe someone needs to hear that. Maybe you've been praying for someone and haven't seen a change. Well, maybe you need to change the way you pray. Maybe you need to change the way you pray. So I'm going to write that in there. So we are going in Matthew chapter six, verse 19 to 34. I'm going to use the Amplify version today. It says, do not store up for yourselves material treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys but and where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, 34. It says to go down to 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear spiritually, your whole body will be full of light, benefiting from God's perception. But if your eye is bad, spiritually blind, your whole body will be full of darkness, devoid of God's precepts. So if the very light inside of you, your inner self, your heart, your conscience is darkness, how great and terrible is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other. He will hate one or love the other. You can't love both. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon, money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. So therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, uneasy or distracted about your life as to what will eat or what you will drink, 
nor about your body as to what you will wear if life is life not more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow a seed nor reap the harvest nor gather the crops into the barns and yet your heavenly father keeps feeding them are you not worth more than a bird and who of you are worrying can add another hour to the length of your life and why are you worried about clothes? See how the lilies and the wild flowers of the field, they do not labor, nor do they spin wool of clothing. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the graph of the field, which is alive and green today and tomorrow is cut down, thrown as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? you a little faith so therefore do not worry or be anxious uneasy or distracted saying what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear for the pagan the gentiles eagerly seek all these things but but do not worry for heavenly father knows that you need them but first and most importantly seek aim to strive after his kingdom and his righteousness his way in doing and being right the attitude and the character of god all these things will be given to you also so do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself and each each day has enough trouble of its own just i remember when the lord gave me that scripture and I really had a Rama revelation from him. What does that mean? I really was awakened to that scripture. And worry became very like non-existent because he said, if I'm providing the birds with worms and they have water to take a bath and they are clothed in their feathers, why would I not do more for you if they're just a bird? And I know we've read that before, but until you don't get an actual awakening of a scripture in your life, it would never mean anything to you. That scripture has to wake you up. And when you become awakened, then, then it becomes your life. So we can't just read God's word without being awakened to it. Because then you're just reading a book. If you have a spirit of poverty, your measure is where? It says that your measure is where? Here on earth. If you are free, it is the result of having your measure, your treasure of your heart up in heaven. When your heart is your, when your money is your treasure, your eye and the ter interpretation, I'm sorry, when your when your heart is in the treasure of heaven, your eye, the interpretation of what you see is clear. It's good. It's generous. It's, it's living out of the place of light. But when your treasure is down here on earth, what you see is bad. It's evil. It's blocked. It's stingy. So there he is. He's saying what you, what you see because of the way you have your your heart your soul set up you know if you're if it's projecting light then it's good then it's generous then it's clear then it's kind then it's abundant but when it's bad when your heart is bad and it's connected into the wrong connection like darkness then it's it's blocked it becomes stingy it becomes evil it becomes oppressed it becomes depressed um, it, it becomes the opposite of good. This session, we're going to do something different. You're going to journal. You're going to journal and you're going to write to the Father what you are now thinking about Jesus' words as a result of working through the passage. You take five minutes to do this. So you're going to write to your father, what you are thinking about this scripture. Then you're going to pray. You're going to ask the Lord to search your heart in regard to the issue of worry. You're going to ask the Holy Spirit to make 
fresh awareness of Christ that is living in you because Christ is the hope of us experiencing his glory. You're going to ask for his love and his care for you to be evident today, not tomorrow, today. And then you're going to draw close and you're going to raise your hands and you're going to minister your love back to him. By faith, receive your physical needs being met by faithful God. Pray for the windows of heaven to be open so that you can bless others too. So I'm going to write in um, your steps for this lesson. Um, listen, I'm going to make this an, all the time. I'm going to say the same thing. If you are not taking the steps that are needed to break this yoke of poverty in your life, then the problem in your life is you. Because there, Christianity, being a Christian requires, it requires of you. It requires of you to move, okay? We are not Christians who sit, we move. When I told you about the two stories of the people, I'm gonna tell you something. They both sat in movement. What does that mean? They sat in movement. They sat down and they began to move their mouth and, and began to use their mouth as a tool to receive what God has for us, to receive the promise, to receive his faithfulness. They didn't know what to do. I was a father with children, single, running, running the world, chasing after God. He didn't know what to do. He did. He knew one thing that he was all provider and all he needed to do was open up his mouth and begin to speak in a language that can only touch heaven because it's heaven's language. If you don't have heaven's language, then you begin to pray and pray to God, not on a level where you don't understand your identity on a level of understanding who you are in Christ. Because God will move as according to the faith. You know, okay, so let me give you an example. We are in a position now where we're looking for a place. Okay? So we're looking for a place. And I'm driving around and I'm saying... I'm going to, listen, I got to position myself to be at the right place at the right time. That's all I know. I got to be at the right place at the right time. I And being in my house is not the right place at the right time. I got to be at the right place at the right time. We don't know what God has. And I began to sing. I sang a song that came forth that says, God, where do you want me to look? What am I looking for? when you hold the key to my open door. And that song came forth as a warrior's cry, as a warrior sound, where I can hear the sound that was the melody that put this song together. And I began to decree that. I said, God, show me, show me where I need to be. Show me where I need to go because you have opened the door. I didn't say, here's a difference. I didn't say, God, open the door for us, that you have all doors open for us, Lord, that I may walk into the open door that you have opened for us. No, 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 no. I said, show me where I need to be. Now I'm saying I am willing to go wherever you send me. I'm willing to go wherever you call me. All I need to know is where you open that door. I'm willing to show up wherever you open that door. Okay? So there's a difference. There's a difference in your mindset. See, I don't have 
all the provision and the resources we need for this open door. But God has it and he opens it. And so therefore, I'm not striving, I'm inviting. I'm inviting Jesus into my situation. And I'm saying why? Because it's you that called me. It is you who ordained me. It is you who, who is my king, my savior, and my Lord. And so therefore, if I begin to strive, I'm guarantee you we have tried. We're looking A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and I went all the way down. And then I said, enough. Do you hear me? Like enough. We do not do things according to our own. So therefore, I began to declare. Well, yesterday I realized that a lot of times in Israel, when Israel didn't have a solution to what they were going through, they didn't have an answer to where they were going, they began to sing. Had no idea. It was brought to my attention by the Holy Spirit yesterday while I was going through some scriptures and he says, do you see what I'm showing you? And he said, when there was nothing else to do, they worship and they sang songs of deliverance and the Lord delivered. And so that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. How does this stuff work? I don't know. It's, it's supernatural. It's supernatural. It's just supernatural, guys. It's just supernatural. We don't have answers, but he does it every time. He opens the door. He, he, he brings the provision. I don't know. He just does. He just does because he just is. And if I sit back and think about and try to worry about where it's going, where we're going, I'm not worrying, but I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking on, I'm looking across the land. Where do we place our tent? Where should we bring the presence? Because it is for, it is his glory that I'm here, not mine. Trust me, if you ask me, I'm ready to depart from this place to another state. You, you, because so, you know, but it's, I'm not, I, but it's a time, his time is not yet. His time is not yet. It's not, it's not now. So we must stay faithful to our assignments. We must stay faithful to where we need to be with God. And so therefore, even though all that was in within me would love to go somewhere else and start fresh, I have to stay faithful until that time comes. So right now I am on an assignment and I know that the door is open. I just need to look. I need to find and while I'm looking and while I'm finding, I am declaring a sound of heaven that there's no way in the world that heaven will not meet me because heaven looks for heaven. Heaven doesn't look for flesh. Heaven looks for heaven and we have to stay faithful to heaven, not our flesh. So I hope that this helps you today. I hope that this breaks off the yoke of depression. This breaks off the yoke of worry. This breaks off the yoke of loneliness. That this breaks off the yoke that is opposite to life. You cannot live life opposite of living. Anything opposite of living is dead. So we are still breathing. We need to give God praise for that. Because when I was not with the Lord and I was waking up every morning, I could not stand the stench of my life. I hated it. And I, and I, and I woke up knowing that there was somebody, there had to be a God, there had to be a higher power, something, because there's no way in the world that I get up every morning and I could feel the sense of something greater in me, that I could be doing more that I could be exceeding more. And then and, and there's so much more to my life, but I can't seem to touch it. I, did, I couldn't grasp it. And so therefore I filled my life with darkness and all it ever did, all it ever did was kill me. I hated it. I hated it. And God came for me and I got, and, and I'm, I'm set free. I, I'm, set, I'm so set free that I'm set free from people. I'm set free from myself that I set myself free from people.
So what happens is that the, your life with Christ is every day revealing another layer of truth, another layer of truth to reveal and to remove all that you entangled yourself with. Because now when you, when you come to Christ, you have the tools that sets you free from what? From garbage, from the stench, okay? From the stench. And I had the opportunity to impart this to my children. So they go through stuff, but they remember. I remember my mom did this and they use that. So they understand that, you know, there's a God. I've seen what he's done with my mom. I've seen what he what he's done in our in our craziest situations. I've seen how he's pulled us out. So they have been a witness to God. Even they've been a witness to the darkness in our life, and they've been a witness to the light of my life. So they get to choose now without an excuse. Why am I saying that? Because poverty, okay, is a mindset that is looking to destroy you, looking to get you to never succeed in your life, to never be the person that you, that God had written out for you. You, people have died with their life, never ever accomplishing all the good things God had for them. Why? Because this thing takes their mind and it covers it and twists it so you'll never be the person that God has ever called you to be. You're going to be the person that, you know, the enemy wants you to be. And so I'm going to write down in the comments. Yes, might not have it, but God has it. Exactly, my brother. Yes, we have it, but God has it. Amen. Because that's exactly true. You know, we don't have it, but God does. And guess what he says? That I'm entitled to write out a check in faith and he will fulfill it. Now, I'm not going to tell you, go ahead and write. Listen, I wrote out a check and I've waited. I've waited for those finances to come. I was write the check and I'll sit there and wait. And that's faith. We've paid, we've paid a lot of bills. A lot of our life is based on faith. It's not based on anything else. No hocus pocus. No, no, nothing, nothing. We don't need, we know, and I gotta tell you that this season, God has been using people mighty, mighty, in so many ways to bless, bless this house. And I cannot complain, but I'm so glad that I can see him doing his hand on us. So with that being said, we end today. We end today and I am encouraging you to take the steps. I can't do this for you. You have to do it for yourself. I can only hand it to you. And so, cause I have to do my own work. And so let's pray. Father, we just thank you for these seeds today. We thank you that you have watering them as we go on our day. We thank you that you are the one, the great I am, the all knowing, you know all things in us, God. There's nothing that you have missed. You know, you know our suffering, you know, you know when we're doing good, you know when we're doing bad, you know the need, God, and you send forth that need in however way it needs to be sent. You send it, Lord. Lord, increase our faith. The scriptures today says you a little faith. Increase our faith, God. Increase our faith to receive greater. See, we have a faith of the mustard seed that even if a mustard seed can move a mountain, God, imagine what we can do if that mustard seed would grow. Our faith would increase and we would receive all that you have ordained for us in the beginning of time. Lord, before we were even born, you wrote it out. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that. God, we can see it now that there is going to be an abundance in those who hear, an abundance in those who are seeing, and an abundance in those who are believing. And, Lord, we just thank you for breaking the yoke over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Tomorrow's another day, and we will be doing Lesson 11. Stay blessed.